Welcome in on a Wednesday, another big day on CBS News 24 7. A big moment in the spotlight for vice presidential nominee Senator J.D. Vance tonight. And senators on Capitol Hill want to know who's to blame for what happened leading up to the assassination attempt on former President Donald Trump. I'm Reed Cowan. Let's go. All right, let's get you started in Milwaukee. All eyes on vice presidential nominee Senator J.D. Vance. He takes the stage tonight, but he's warming up by speaking at an event on finance very soon. Will it be sort of a preview of what he will say on the big stage tonight? We are watching for it. As soon as we see him take to that stage on finance, you'll see it right here on the stream. But for now, CBS News correspondent Natalie Brand is live at the RNC in Milwaukee. Okay, so Natalie, tonight especially is the night to sell Senator Vance to the American public. Good to be with you, Reed. That's right. And also introduce Senator Vance to those who may not be familiar with his personal story, which, uh, according to allies, is really a strategic move to put him on the ticket. You may be familiar with his memoir, Hillbilly Elegy, about growing up in poverty in Ohio. His family had struggles uh, with drug addiction. And this is really a story of rising out of such difficult circumstances. Uh, in speaking to the lieutenant governor of Ohio earlier this week, he said that he believes Senator Vance's background will really allow him uh, to reach out to working class voters in some of these key Rust Belt states, which are so important to, as you know, uh, November. These are states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, that could help determine the election. Uh, so again, I think we can expect to hear a lot more about Senator Vance's background. And since tonight, Reid is also focused on foreign policy, it will be interesting to hear if Senator Vance goes into some of his personal views uh, on foreign policy issues. Notably, he's been one of the most vocal opponents of additional foreign aid uh, to Ukraine in Congress. So we'll have to wait and see what other kinds of themes are in his big speech tonight. Well, and we know yesterday the theme for convention was make America safe again, to use that talking point by Republicans. They had a lot of speakers to back up the case that we need to do more where public safety is concerned. So tonight, if they take more of that international focus, what other speakers can we uh, expect to build the case about that? Yeah, once again, there's this long list of speakers ranging, you know, from known uh, lawmaker names to also, uh, again, what the campaign is calling these everyday Americans to share their stories. Tonight, we're expecting to hear from a number of veterans. There's no question uh, that the Trump campaign wants to talk about uh, the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan and some of these other big foreign policy moments that have happened over the last couple. Uh, couple of years. So again, on this list, it's kind of a range of known political figures, Republican uh, political leaders, but then also uh, individuals to kind of share their personal experience. We are expecting to hear again from veterans and also Gold Star families. Building a case and also introducing the nation widely to Senator J.D. Vance as the vice presidential nominee. Natalie, thank you so much for that today. Hey, our video feeds and monitors have video telling the story of a deadly police shooting outside of where you just saw Natalie standing there at the Republican National Convention right outside that security perimeter. But before we show this to you, we want to warn you, some of this video from police body camera may be hard to watch. Let's go to it now. So we're going to freeze the video before police fire that fatal shot. But this all started yesterday when a man carrying one knife in each hand refused police commands. And this was that crucial moment. He wouldn't drop the knives. Police say they were forced to fire when that man charged. The officers involved are members of the Columbus, Ohio Police Department. The information we have leaves a clear impression that these Columbus officers, they saved the life of an unarmed man from death or perhaps serious injury. So family members identified the man killed as 43-year-old Samuel Sharp. So far, we don't know a lot about Sharp or his motive for having a knife in each hand. Uh, let's jump the map to Capitol Hill now, where House Speaker Mike Johnson just announced 
that he's going to set up a task force to investigate the assassination attempt on the life of former President Donald Trump. Now, keep in mind, this comes to senators and House members will be briefed very soon by the Justice Department and Homeland Security on this exact issue. But, you know, many of the answers that everybody in the country wants come from Butler, Pennsylvania, where this violence played out. And that's where we find Andy Sheehan with the very latest on the investigation. OK, so we know that they've been able to get into the phone of the shooter. What other revelations do we have today? Well, in the past few days, there's been a lot of uh, finger pointing, perhaps a blame game between the Secret Service and local law enforcement. Uh, the Secret Service handled the security uh, closest around the former president, but they delegated the outside uh, security to a number of different local police agencies. Uh, that is where the shooter was able to climb up on a building and get a clear shot of the president. Uh, we have learned in recent days that uh, instead of having snipers on the roof of that, that building, that there were uh, local uh, sharpshooters that were inside of the building, uh, you know, to, for virtually no effect whatsoever. Um, so there's been some alleged finger pointing at the locals, why this building wasn't covered. Uh, just last night, uh, the director, the secretary of the Secret Service called uh, the Butler County Sheriff uh, apologized and took full responsibility for this. And this is what the locals have been saying, that this was a Secret Service operation from the beginning, uh, that they were in charge of directing uh, the local people. Uh, they are be the secretary uh, is being called in front of Congress, as is uh, Alejandro Mayorkas, the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, next week to answer questions. And this will be one of the main questions. Why was that building uh, left unsecured? Why were there no snipers on top of that building? And who was responsible? And now the Secret Service says that they will take uh, full brunt of that, that, uh, that responsibility. Reporting in the rain live from one of our communities in the United States for the stream. Andy, we thank you so much. By the way, CBS News has learned that while the Trump assassination attempt played out, the former president's security detail was already on high alert about an Iranian plot to kill Trump. We've learned in response, Donald Trump's security detail beefed up even weeks before the shooting at the campaign rally. Iran denies the accusations of a plot, and officials have found no ties between that Pennsylvania shooter and that plot that we're talking about from overseas. Hey, our video monitor is taking us on the campaign trail today in Las Vegas, where President Joe Biden works to shore up black and Latino voters. CBS News reporter Aaron Navarro has the president's plans. President Biden is wrapping up his campaign swing in Nevada today with a focus on Latino voters. After an interview with Univision earlier today, the Latino media outlet, he will be speaking at the Unidos U.S. conference. This is a large gathering for one of the largest civil rights Latino groups. This is all part of an effort and focus from Biden and his campaign towards black and minority voters. Earlier this week, he was speaking at an NAACP conference as well as as a black voter focused economic summit hosted by the Congressional Black Caucus Chair Stephen Horsford. But today he will be focused on Latino voters in addition to sp stopping at a community event later this afternoon before he leaves the state of Nevada. All of this comes as the first campaign swing for President Biden after Saturday's assassination attempt on former President Donald Trump. So far, we've heard President Biden at least stick to the issues, saying that. Uh, uh, he wants to cap rent increases to 5%, and he wants to do more for affordable housing here in Nevada, a big battleground state that he won in 2020 and will likely need to keep in his column for 2024. Reed? Say Nevada is definitely still in play. All right, we want to get to this. In an interview with BET, President Joe Biden mentioning openness to reforming the institution that could be the biggest obstacle to Democratic priorities in a potential second term. We're talking about the Supreme Court. Listen to this. Let me ask you about reproductive rights. You've had your <clears throat> vice president out, out, out front on that. Um, talking about the long game, people will say that there's an example of Democrats not playing the long game well, that conservatives have been saying they're going to get rid of this for years now, and they got it. You've said that you will restore it. 
How can you be assured that you'll be able to do that? The Supreme Court did it. Trump appointed the Supreme Court for the express purpose of doing it. So that's the way it they're works. They're still going to have the majority, no matter if you win or lose. Well, there's going to probably be two more appointments to the court. There's probably two people going to resign or resign, retire. Just imagine court, if he has two more appointments on that, what that means forever. So we also want to get you results from a poll of Democrats that cannot be good right now for President Joe Biden. This is a new poll from the Associated Press, and here are the findings. 65% of Democrats and 77% of independents polled believe Joe Biden should drop out of the race. We also have video, speaking of the campaign trail, coming to us from Joint Base Andrews, Vice President Kamala Harris leaving for Kalamazoo, Michigan, another battleground state, to try to get votes for the president. She's also going to host a conversation with Donald Trump's former national security official, Olivia Troy. They are reportedly going to be talking about Troy's personal reproductive health story. Keep in mind, reproductive rights is a big part of the Democrats' drumbeat leading up to the general election, as you just heard in that BET interview. All right, when we come back, we are going to be talking about storm damage in New York State. CBS News 24-7 streaming coast to coast and worldwide. We'll watch the monitors until we get back. Looking live at the venue hosting the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. Another big day and night of speakers. In fact, one expected speaker, Donald Trump's former aide, Peter Navarro, freshly released from a Miami federal prison. You'll remember Navarro served a four-month sentence for refusing to comply with a congressional subpoena related to that January 6th investigation. By the way, he is one of two members of Trump's circle. Steve Bannon started serving his four-month sentence earlier this month at a federal prison in Connecticut. So let's move the map now to New Mexico and a big get-out-of-jail request from the armorer on the film Rust. Days after Alec Baldwin's case was dismissed, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed now wants her conviction overturned or, at a minimum, a new trial. The judge sentenced that armorer earlier this year to 18 months in prison on involuntary manslaughter charges. Gutierrez was responsible for providing dummy and blank rounds to that movie set. That was her job, but she accidentally loaded the gun that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins with a live round. Our monitors taking us now overseas to Thailand. What a story this is. Two Americans are among six dead inside a hotel room there. We know more today about what may have killed them. Officials discovered traces of cyanide inside a teapot and inside teacups. Those victims range in age from 37 to 56. The group of three men and three women all checked into separate rooms, but hotel staff say they found all of their bodies yesterday in one single suite. Our monitor is bringing video from cameras showing extreme weather. This is in Rome, New York, where severe storms tore through on Tuesday. Look at that. Windshield wipers working overtime, not even able to keep up with the dousing of rain. The street lights are on, but slow going there on the roads. D very dangerous. In fact, more than a dozen counties in central New York are right now under severe thunderstorm watch at this very moment. And then look at this. This video coming to us showing the aftermath, the damage of that rain. Look at this. Rooftops tore off. And then a place of worship. That steeple just bent in the wind and then fell right into that parish. That church is a historic church and destroyed. This is in Secaucus, New Jersey. We also understand 10,000 are without electricity. Last night and this morning, this is what they woke up to. In fact, a state of emergency declared there as the governor promised resources to try to get the money to speed the recovery. All right, so let's jump the map to New Jersey where thunderstorms downed trees and left a lot of people without electricity as well. Uh, these storms hitting uh, like really a hammer and leaving just as fast. In fact, our CBS crews in that community as it happened, listen to this. It was insane. I've never seen wind like that. And all of a sudden? All of a sudden. It was like sunny, the trees started moving, and then the wind just took. Trees in the backyard are down. The canopy went flying. It was crazy. It's a helpless feeling, isn't it? it? I was scared. I've never in all my years seen anything like that. It was crazy. 
So as those storms hit the northeast and we know people are without electricity, let's talk to Zoe because the heat is on and that is not a good situation when people can't even turn on the air conditioner. No, definitely not a great situation when that cold front is impacting places across the east coast along with the heat. So let's take a look at that cold front because yes, it is going to continue to impact northeastern parts of the United States. And as that cold front moves through, there is a bit of good news. It finally is going to begin to cool things down starting tomorrow. Today, though, we are still going to be dealing with quite a lot of heat and the risk for severe weather. So let's toss things over to Baltimore with Meg McNamara. Well, that's right, Zoe. So we're getting ready for day three of this potentially dangerous heat, and we are really looking at the last day for a while, and that's because we're going to have a very strong cold front move through later on tonight. Out ahead of that front, though, we have to deal with the heat, humidity, and then the strong to severe storms. Heat alerts in effect across the state once again. Now, I will say the difference for today is the temperatures are backing off a little bit. I think most of us steer clear of the triple digits. But what we lose with the heat, we're going to make up for in the humidity. So we still have to bank on it feeling about 105 degrees. So not a good day to be out and about if you don't have to be. We also, though, have a flood watch. So the storms that move through this afternoon and evening are going to be very efficient rainmakers. And that could trigger flash flooding in the Baltimore, D.C. metro area. We watch this batch of storms move through in the late afternoon into the evening. We're talking damaging winds hail and also expecting a lot of lightning. The good news is we start to feel so much better Thursday into Friday. Temperatures dropping off and the humidity as well. Zoe. Yeah, so good news is on the way when it comes to heat, but severe storms are still going to be pushing across the eastern parts of the United States. I'll break down more details coming up in just a bit. Reed. Zoe, thanks. Let's move to video out of Texas, where it has been a miserable week for those in the wake of Barrel knocking out power to more than a million people at one point. But here's your headline out of the Lone Star State right now. Lights out and no AC, but the number of people affected are now at a little less than 100,000 people. So power crews have made some progress getting the lights back on. Uh, this is happening quickly after Texas Governor Abbott slammed Centerpoint Energy for not getting the lights on fast enough. Listen to Texans Tara and Lara, who say the outage really affects those who are the most vulnerable. Some of them have mobility issues. Some of them have health issues. There are people with young children, babies, and they can't they can't withstand the heat. I have a seven year old who has um, is prone to seizures um, and she's got some other issues. So I had to send her actually on Tuesday to my parents house and we were under the impression from Centerpoint that we were going to have energy by Sunday evening. And so we came back with her. And so they waited. Well, the governor's state utilities commission launched an investigation into Centerpoint's preparedness as that storm approached. Hey, when we come back, news from our communities. The 10-year anniversary of a man killed by police and what his mother does with a very difficult day. Back in a minute. The Republican National Convention in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, another big day of speakers, not the least of which, of course, is Republican Senator J.D. Vance, who is also the choice of Donald Trump to be his running mate for vice president. Let's move on our map to Nashville, Illinois, and a story we broke on the stream yesterday, concerns about a dam failure causing hundreds to have to run from their homes. And look at this, water rushed in at once in a century rains, really, it caused that local reservoir to be overtopped. So that brought a lot of flooding in the city. In fact, we understand that at least one woman had to be rescued from her home because the roads were closed. So what about the failure of the dam? We've been watching that over the last 24 hours. So far, good news, it's holding, but officials there say repairs are needed and fast. And so our CBS partners are talking to viewers there. In fact, Chad in his neighborhood says, this is just too much and he's ready to get out and move. We had 17 inches before. Uh, this is 37 inches this time, 35, 37 inches. It's never got that high before and it's brand new welder, brand new deep freeze full of meat. How are you feeling, man? Uh, it's, What's going through your head? Yeah, we're, we're, we're done with this. We, we want to move and it's a lot of damage. 
So Chad's out of there and a little piece of information we just got as we bring in Zoe Mintz. More rain expected and that means more risk for people like Chad. Yes, unfortunately, even more rain on top of the about six inches that they've received in the past eight hours or so. And it's not just rain, but it's widespread severe weather that we are still expecting as another cold front will be moving across the northeastern parts of the United States. And you can see that cold front. I'm standing directly on it here and it will continue to make its way across northeastern parts of the United States. This includes Washington, D.C., Baltimore, like we talked about before, with damaging wind gusts and the potential for a little bit of hail as well. But like we were talking about just a minute ago, it's the rain accumulation across the central United States that we are going to be a little bit more concerned about. The areas that are lighting up in blue, that includes places in southern Illinois that are going to be seeing more additional rainfall. Let's take a closer look at what severe weather impacts we're expecting today, because right now you can see very clearly the widespread thunderstorms that are continuing to develop along that cold front. It's going to drop a lot of rainfall. An additional three to five inches is possible, especially down across the Midwest that have already seen inundated roads, and that's going to be a big issue. But severe weather potential across the Northeast and across eastern Colorado, too, where they might be seeing damaging wind gusts upwards of 60 miles an hour, potentially even up to 75. There is some slightly better news. There is not as much of a tornado threat as this cold front moves through, but it's going to be those straight line wind gusts that are going to cause damage along with check out an excessive rainfall risk that is going to continue all things to keep our eyes on today. But luckily this cold front is also going to cool things down just a little bit and cooler weather is always a good thing, especially with the places that don't have air conditioning right now. The places that don't have power right now. Very good news that the cold front should be cooling things down, but unfortunately it comes along with the severe weather. Oh my goodness. This is a roller coaster. Oh yeah, we're just going to keep our eyes on it. Hopefully everyone stays safe. We're keeping them in our prayers. We know you are. Thank you so much. Okay, so in just a little while, we're going to be going live once again to the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. We're going to be talking to Finn Gomez with CBS, our political director. Change in the winds of politics. A union president speaking to Republicans. We'll be back in just a minute. Today marks 10 years since the murder of Eric Garner at the hands of a New York City police officer who put Eric in a chokehold. Well, today, his mother is leading a march in his honor. CBS New York's Natalie Dudridge joins us live from Staten Island. What do they hope to accomplish with this march on this anniversary? Well, Reed, they are still pushing for change, but just a short while ago, we spoke to Eric Garner's mother. She says she remembers this day 10 years ago like it was yesterday, and that is why she is holding this event here in Tompkins Square Park. You can see there are people eating, and there are speakers, there are dancers, there are people sharing stories about him. In fact, the street we are standing on right now was renamed Eric Garner Way. Eric Garner was 43 when he was killed in 2014. In one of the most high profile controversial police involved deaths in New York City's history, it sparked protests here and across the country. He was arrested for allegedly selling loose cigarettes. And this incident was captured on cell phone video when Garner could be heard 11 times telling officers, I can't breathe before he died. His death was ruled a homicide. Authorities determined NYPD officer Daniel Pantaleo used a banned chokehold, but he was never charged. He he was eventually fired in 2019. That's five years after this happened. And then in 2020, the New York State Assembly passed the Eric Garner Anti Chokehold Act. And it states that any officer who injures or kills someone through the use of a chokehold can face up to 15 years behind bars. And that word, those words, I can't breathe, became the rallying cry for the Black Lives Matter movement, symbolizing police brutality and racial injustice. And again, Eric Garner's mother, Gwen Carr, says there's still much work to do. She's still seeking justice for her son. She says there were other officers who were involved in her son's death that day that she says should have been fired, but they were not. So she continues to fight.
die for him and other families who have been through tragedy like this. Eric Garner was a father. He also has grandchildren, and in fact, uh, they are here somewhere today, um, just off camera. Uh, we can't swing around to it, but there are some kids playing basketball. Uh, one of them, his grandson. I'm just going to duck under the camera as we head over to the basketball players over here. Now, again, the Garner family saying today is about sharing his story. You can see uh, the youth over there sharing his story with them, teaching this next generation to continue to push for change, hoping something like this does not happen again. Now, this commemoration will continue to take place right through 7 p.m. tonight, and all members of the public, people who are affected on Staten Island, are welcome. We're here live on Staten Island. Natalie Dudridge, CBS 2 News. And Natalie, we know we're in a sensitive time in our nation. We are in an election season. Are you hearing anything from anybody there in that community where you are reporting live, that they're aware of what's going on in Milwaukee, what's being talked about at the Republican National Convention, and also the campaign trail for President Joe Biden? Well, here in this community so far this afternoon, I can see uh, there's a van here, the Justice Network. Uh, I just lost my earpiece in case you asked me another question here. Uh, but we haven't heard anything like that. The focus today is on celebration. It's also on the reflection of his life. And so far, family members, they actually tell us they're, they're trying to stay out of the politics, just keep today's focus on his life and this anniversary. Natalie, thank you so much for that live report. Our video monitors now take us on the campaign trail in Las Vegas today, where President Joe Biden works hard to shore up black and Latino voters. He's set to address the largest annual gathering of Latino advocates and policymakers in Las Vegas later today. In fact, CBS News has also confirmed the president is considering reforms to the highest court in the land, including term limits for justices and an enforceable code of ethics for the Supreme Court. Those would all, though, require congressional approval. President Biden also sat down for an exclusive interview with BET, answering a question about what would make him reevaluate staying in the race. You can watch that interview tonight on BET, which is a partner of our uh, parent company, Paramount. A new video coming out of Michigan right now. Vice President Kamala Harris just arrived in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Now, that's a battleground state. They need Michigan to win. Uh, the vice president hosting a conversation with Donald Trump's former national security official, Olivia Troy. They will sit down and talk about, on the mic in front of cameras, Troy's personal reproductive health story. Keep in mind, reproductive rights is a big part of the Democrats' drumbeat leading up to the general election. We can turn our cameras now to extreme weather. This is out of Rome, New York, where severe storms tore through on a Tuesday. More than a dozen counties in central New York under severe thunderstorm watches as heavy rain marched across that state and reduced visibility at many points. So many people having to deal with this. As they wake up today, they are out on the streets and they're seeing, look, trees downed in parks, roadways impassable, even cars flip there. The recovery is going to take a long time as Mother Nature continues to bear down on these United States, Zoe. Yes, unfortunately, the heat is going to continue, though. That is kind of the off chance. The heat today all ahead of more severe weather on the way this afternoon. But let's focus on the heat really quick because that's going to be a big issue across many locations that don't have power because of the severe weather. And that's what we're going to be dealing with down near Texas, down across other locations in the United States. But that, again, is going to be one of those bigger issues that we're going to be seeing this afternoon. East coast of the United States going to continue to deal with heat. Yesterday, Washington, D.C. saw their hottest day in over 30 years. Heat indices will continue to be well above these actual temperatures. So Charlotte, Norfolk, Washington, D.C., Technically, it is a couple of degrees cooler than yesterday, but the heat indices with the humidity is really going to be a big issue into this afternoon. So let's take a look at our heat map because heat related illness is going to be again one of those bigger issues that we're going to be talking about this afternoon, especially across the eastern and southeastern parts of the United States. Again, it's North and South Carolina that have that higher risk of heat related illness, not necessarily because the temperatures are hotter, but because they are dealing with the heat related illness when it comes to humidity, humidity making it 
feel significantly hotter in some of those locations. So those are all things to keep in mind as we step out over the next 24 hours. Tomorrow, though, that is also going to be an issue when it comes to Florida. But notice that cold front that brought severe weather is going to cool things down across the east coast of the United States. But it's the west coast that is going to begin seeing this heat building up this weekend. There are already widespread excessive heat watches that are in effect with temperatures getting well above 120 across the desert southwest. It's for what we're keeping our eye on. But today it's the east coast that's still dealing with the oppressive heat and humidity. Reed. All right. Thank you so much. Our video monitors take us across the pond where this morning King Charles presides over Parliament. This year marks the first time in 14 years a left-leaning party won in the general election there. CBS News foreign senior correspondent Elizabeth Palmer is there. Reed, it's been a wet, gray summer so far here in the UK, but today the sun shone at last on one of the great spectacles of the political calendar. King Charles and Queen Camilla set out from Buckingham Palace in horse-drawn carriages for the House of Lords. Inside, the Lords themselves were joined by hundreds of members of Parliament who had walked over from the House of Commons, including the brand-new Prime Minister, Sir Keir Starmer, who was elected not even a month ago. And then in this grand chamber, full to overflowing, the King, who's currently being treated for cancer, read what's called the King's Speech, although it is, in fact, written by the government, and it sets out the government's legislative targets for the new session of Parliament. Britons were listening carefully. This is a Labour, that is, centre-left government, starting its very first session with pledges for stability and transparency after what's been a chaotic period under the conservatives. Some of the key commitments we heard in the speech, support for ambitious building of houses and infrastructure, bringing the railroads back under state control, and pledging support for Ukraine, including eventual NATO membership. And there was one especially quaint relic in all this pageantry. One member of Parliament wasn't in the chamber, but was actually over at Buckingham Palace, under guard, literally held hostage until the monarch safely returned. Now, all that dates from the 17th century, when relations between the King and Parliament were especially poisonous, although, thank goodness, that's not the case anymore. Read. Peak. All right, so we have video coming in right now from the Middle East as we learn that that U.S. built pier meant to bring humanitarian aid into Gaza, it's officially shut down. Deborah Potter reports this follows a commander's recommendation. Gaza has suffered one of the deadliest weeks of strikes since the war began, leaving the few hospitals that are still functioning overrun with mostly civilian casualties. American volunteer in Gaza, Dr. Mohammed Soube, told us that about two-thirds of all casualties that he is seeing are children, and that aid trucks with crucial medical equipment are still being prevented from entering the territory, forcing them to regularly amputate the limbs of children who would otherwise not need such a drastic procedure if they had the appropriate resources. Israel has been launching daily strikes, often in areas deemed safe zones. This father has fled violence multiple times in a bid to keep his family safe until yesterday. Life was wrenched apart in an instant when an Israeli airstrike tore through their tent camp, killing his beloved 21-month-old son, whom he had just put down for an afternoon nap. It bears pointing out that nine months into this war, foreign journalists are still not allowed to enter and report independently from Gaza. But read, doctors tell us that the situation is worse than ever. That's why we're glad you're there to report. Thank you so much. When we come back, shifting political winds. Get this, a union boss speaking to Republicans in Milwaukee. We'll chat live with CBS political director Finn Gomez when we come back. All right, all eyes on Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and our monitor showing us two live feeds. Day three of the Republican National Convention kicking off tonight. So the focus will be on foreign policy and the new GOP vice presidential nominee, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. He will take to the stage to tell us about his life story. But now we want to talk about something that Democrats likely will not want to hear today. Results from a poll 
of Democrats that really cannot be good for President Joe Biden as J.D. Vance takes the stage tonight. This is from the Associated Press. It's brand new. And here's the finding. 65% of Democrats and 77% of independents believe Joe Biden should drop out of the race. Meanwhile, California Congressman Adam Schiff responding to this, releasing this statement. While the choice to withdraw from the campaign is President Biden's alone, I believe it is time for him to pass the torch and in doing so, secure his legacy of leadership by allowing us to defeat Donald Trump in the upcoming election, close quote. So we have experts in Milwaukee. CBS News political director Finn Gomez is live at that convention in Milwaukee. And you've got some news to break here on CBS 24-7. You just got response to Adam Schiff's statement from somebody in the Biden-Harris camp. Yeah, greetings from uh, here in Wisconsin. I do have a response response from the uh, Biden-Harris campaign to Adam Schiff. Now, it's important to note about Adam Schiff, two things. One is that he is a top House Democrat who has a really good chance of being the next senator from the state of California. Also, another thing, he is someone who is close to former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, who we have, we, who we have reported has been making calls uh, to uh, other Democratic allies about uh, to nudging uh, the president out of uh, to reconsider his uh, his candidacy and where he is on the ticket. Um, yes, from the Biden campaign, uh, I was told uh, just a little while ago that their response to Schiff is this, that the president's out there campaigning with black and Latino voters, a crucial voting bloc in the Democratic Party. He's out in Nevada campaigning with them. And he and the, this advisor said that uh, that he intends to stay in the race and win it. Uh, so he's not intending to drop out anytime soon, uh, and that Democrats should be instead not focused internally, but externally on what is being said behind me, what is being said behind me at this podium uh, by leaders of this party, and also to be focused on Project 2025. Uh, as you know, that is the, the Heritage Foundation's uh, essentially vetting a system, a, a, a program to vet the, 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 the potential next uh, administration if, if Donald Trump regains the White House. But it's a very pointed, very and a very uh, challenging point for the president's uh, re-election efforts right now, which is three months, a little over three months until that November election. They're literally beating a clock. Okay, so you mentioned Project 2025. For our viewers on the stream, just want to drive you to CBS.com. There's a great article on the website that says, what is Project 2025 on that point? Also, there's video circulating of vice presidential nominee Vance, uh, who is speaking to the Heritage Foundation. We can go online, we can see what he has to say about Project 2025. But for now, what will he say from that stage? And it looks like they're testing the lights behind you as well, Finn. Uh, will the lights come on? They are, Vice you presidential tell. nominee, and what will he have to say as he sells himself uh, to the United States? And by the way, the lights just came back. Better. <laughs> better now than later tonight, right? So right. Uh, I, I would note that the, the, the Trump campaign ha has told me that they have, they have disavowed Project 2025. They said they are not working with Project 2025. However, there are former Trump administration officials who are involved in Project 2025. Uh, but Senator Vance, J.D. Vance, uh, the new vice presidential pick, the running mate for Donald Trump, he's going to be making his big address tonight here at the convention. Uh, there, the, as you said, tonight's focus is on foreign policy. The theme is make America strong again. What we do expect is him to, to speak about some of the issues that he has talked about from uh, Capitol Hill, uh, including um, uh, new, including the importance of contrasting the policy that the Trump campaign will have versus the Biden campaign. Uh, you know, he has been a big vocal opponent of, you, of aid to Ukraine. He's been part of that contingent within the Republican Party who says that that should be stopped, that the focus should really be on China. And I do expect that we will hear some of that tonight from J.D. Vance. But again, this is a big, big uh, speech for him. It's, it's the, he's presenting himself not only to the Republican Party, but to the world, to potential voters. Uh, and of course, just 48 hours ago, he was named uh, the running mate after a very long and secretive process, frankly, uh, when we found out on that, uh, the, the, pres the former president's social media platform who the pick was. CBS News political director Finn Gomez in the room when it happened and once again breaking a little bit of news here on CBS News 24-7. There you go. Hey, let's jump the map to Capitol Hill now where House Speaker Mike Johnson just announced that he's going to set up a task force to investigate the assassination attempt on the life 
uh, former President Donald Trump. Now, this comes already as senators and House members will be briefed soon by the Department of Justice and Homeland Security on the violence that played out there in Pennsylvania. Nicole Skanga is live in Washington right now talking about that. What do we expect to hear with this? Yeah, Reed, today, happening in just over an hour, officials from the Secret Service, the Department of Justice, the FBI, providing updates to the Senate and the House. CBS News has learned that some of the participants include Secret Service Deputy Director Ronald Rowe and FBI Deputy Director Paul Abate. This marks the first time lawmakers will be briefed on Saturday's assassination attempt. And of course, it comes amid several congressional investigations already announced, as well as calls for Director Cheadle to testify on Capitol Hill. Now, you mentioned Speaker Mike Johnson today uh, announced he'll create a special task force within the House to investigate the attack on Trump. He added in a social media post that Congress needs answers for what he calls shocking security failures. And in an interview with Fox News, he said that he plans to set the bipartisan task force up on Monday. He called it a precision strike, said that it would be able to move quickly by avoiding some procedural hurdles. Johnson said he spoke with DHS Secretary Mayorkas over the weekend, who did not have satisfactory answers regarding the attack. He also said he plans to call for C Secret Service Director Kimberly Cheadle to resign. Of course, for her part, the director says she has no plans to step down at this point. Something also that was revelatory to me today, the word that Iran had a plot, active plot to assassinate former President Donald Trump, and that his security detail already had intelligence about that. What do you know about this plot by Iran? Yeah, Reed, in the weeks and months before the shooting at Donald Trump's rally, an intelligence source told CBS News there was a significant uptick in chatter online communications concerning an Iranian plot to assassinate the former president. CBS also learned that was backed up by human sourced intelligence obtained by the U.S. Now, the White House's National Security Council alerted Secret Service of the threat. There were also requests by Trump security detail for more help. These were happening at the same time. More assets were granted by the Secret Service. Counter sniper teams like the ones we saw take out the gunman Saturday. Counter assault teams. Those are the agents you saw surround and cover Trump as the shots rang out. Drones, robotic dogs. Of course, Trump has long been a target for the Iranians, most notably after directing the 2020 airstrike that killed a top Iranian commander. Uh, we should point out that at this point in the investigation, uh, there is no known connection between this new threat stream uh, and the gunman during Saturday's attack. Nicole Skanga, thank you so much. Live from our nation's capital and CBS headquarters. We appreciate you. So let's look now to St. Louis and talk about the rain. Heavy rains blasted the city and caused flooding throughout the area. And look at this. That is flood water pouring into the basement of a St. Louis firehouse on Tuesday. First responders, their gear waterlogged there because of this rainwater that equaled flood water. Zoe, let's talk about that. Yeah, unfortunately, about six inches of rain fell in just the past eight hours. That's inundated widespread rivers, and that's created widespread flooding across the Midwest, as we are expecting even more rain accumulation today as well. So let's take a look at that rain accumulation and again, where it's located across the Midwest in the places that have already seen a good amount of rain. They're already looking at those saturated soil levels, and that's what we're going to continue to see again over the next 24 hours hours as this cold front makes its way across the northeastern United States. It's going to bring widespread severe weather as well. So let's take a look at where it is right now because we are dealing with the effects of it across the central United States. You can kind of see that cold front as it sets up and it's again going to be bringing us these widespread chances for severe weather all across northeastern United States and also across eastern parts of Cal Colorado where we're expecting wind gust upwards of 60 to 70 miles an hour along with chances for more flooding. So so all things to keep our eyes on. And again, our, our thoughts are going to be with the people who've already dealt with this for the past week, and they're going to continue to see it today. All right. Well, help each other out there. If you're watching right now in the palm of your hand on CBS News streaming, just reach out to your neighbor. Hey, that's it for us at CBS News 24-7. We thank you for watching. Let's leave you with a live picture in Milwaukee, right inside the headquarters for the Republican National Convention.